Welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. As I'm sure you know, the uh, big story of the week is the massive earthquake uh, that took place on Monday and continued on through the day and uh, continued earthquakes in uh, Turkey and in Syria. We felt it here in Israel and parts of the country. Um, and there are apparently right now, but the best estimate of the UN Tuesday morning is that 20,000 people have died. And what's notable, I mean, two things are notable about this. You know, one is that the first country that offered help uh, was Israel, and there's already an Israeli team from uh, the IDF delegation there to help uh, save people. They arrived overnight, and they started working this morning. Um, and the second thing that's really interesting is that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced yesterday that calls for a help to Israel also came from the Syrians, from Syria, an enemy state that's controlled by Iran, and yet they want Israeli help. Why do they want Israeli help? Well, um, let's ask Sudan. Last week, Foreign Minister Eli Cohen flew to Khartoum to meet with the president of Sudan. Um, and essentially, the three no's of Sudan, of the Sudan, the famous uh, Arab League conference from 1970, no to peace, no to normalization, no to recognition of Israel, no to end of war. I don't remember the three, but they were basically no way we're not talking to the Jews. Uh, they're all gone. Sudan wants to formally enter the Abraham Accords. They're a, officially a member of it, but they haven't opened their uh, embassies here yet. Uh, like the other members of the Accords have, and they want to take a step towards that. And also last week, the president of Chad came to Israel and opened up Chad's embassy in Israel. Um, so, and, and before that, the foreign minister of of, uh, of Greece came here. Why is it that all of these countries are making pilgrimages to Jerusalem and wanting to have closer ties with Israel and asking us for help in their hour of need, even the Syrians? Well, there are, I think, two reasons. The first reason is because Israel's in a position to help. We can help. Obviously, with earthquake relief, our uh, home front command of the IDF since the 1991 Gulf War, when Israel was attacked with Scud missiles by Saddam Hussein, um, Israel has become, has developed cutting edge uh, methods, technologies, uh, modes of operation to save people from uh, mass disasters, natural and war, uh, that exists no place else on earth, not in the United States, not in Britain, not in Russia, not anywhere. We have more capabilities to save people from collapsed buildings than anybody else. Um, so that's one reason. Um, and so they're asking us for help in the case of the earthquake because we can help. But the other reason that all of these countries are coming to us is because we don't threaten them. We're not a superpower, nor do we want to be. We're not an empire, nor do we want to be. In fact, the Torah actually prohibits Jews from building an empire. It gives us the borders of the land of Israel, makes them very explicit, and says, beyond that, you're not allowed to go. This is your land. And so when you look at a country like Chad, you look at a country like Sudan, you look at a country like South Sudan, you look like at all of these different countries, at Hungary, at Poland, even at France and at Germany, when they're trying to figure out how to, and Ukraine, when they're trying to figure out how to protect themselves, uh, they don't want to go to somebody that they're afraid is going to take their country away from them. They don't want help from China that's coming in and putting all these African states in a, death, in a debt trap that they can't get out of. They don't want Iran that's going to try to transform all of them into Shiite jihadists or kill all their Jews or whatever it happens to be. They don't even, they definitely don't want Russia. And they don't even really want many of them in the United States because they don't want to be pushed around. They don't want to be told what they have to do. They want, they want to develop their country in their way. And they see that Israel has done an extraordinary job building 75 years after the establishment of our country. We are a regional power. We have one of the best economies and strongest economies in the world. We weathered the corona storm better than most countries. We came out of the recession from corona faster than most countries. Um, and we're not as impacted as the rest of the Western world by uh, the recession that's now coming uh, to Europe and to the United States, one, because we're energy independent, and two, because we've managed our national debt better. Um, so when you look at why they're coming to us, it's because after 75 years, Israel's incredibly successful. We've done it. 
the Zionist revolution worked and Israel is an extraordinarily successful, powerful state capable not only of defending itself by itself, but capable of helping the nations of the world as well by itself. Um, and that leads me to where we are right now in Israel, because in Israel, you have the elites of our country who are threatening civil war, who are threatening to murder uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and the ministers in his government, um, calling for people to take up arms, saying that if their demands are not met, <clears throat> that they're going to move from protests to actions. These are that the last one was a statement made by the mayor of Tel Aviv last Saturday night. Uh, the explicit threat on the life of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and the ministers in his cabinet, in his government, was made by former IDF uh, pilot uh, Zev Raz, who was the lead pilot in the raid on Osirak nuclear reactor in Iraq in 1981. Um, one of the leading attorneys, the head of the biggest law firm in Israel, Chodek, uh, called for taking up arms in an annual meeting of the of the Bar Association of Israel in Eilat last week. I mean, you were talking about leading members of Israeli society who are making these open calls for civil war. Benny Gantz was the one who talked about civil war. Ehud Barak over the weekend compared President Isaac Herzog of Israel to Neville Chamberlain and Prime Minister Netanyahu to Hitler when he put up a um, photoshopped image of President Herzog holding up a piece of paper over Neville Chamberlain's body when he was showing the Munich Agreement in 1938 with Hitler. And he said that because President Herzog is, Herzog is trying to get the left and the right to sit down and compromise on judicial reform, that he is Neville Chamberlain and that uh, the right wing of Israel, the government, they're the Nazis and Prime Minister Netanyahu is Herzog and this uh, is uh, Hitler. And this is this is a former prime minister of Israel. Same thing, another former uh, defense minister and chief of staff of the IDF like Barack uh, Moshe Yalon is calling the government fascist. They refuse to really condemn the likes of Zev Raz and Chodek and others who are explicitly calling for violence because they say, well, we don't want violence, but this is a fascist, illegitimate government, et cetera, et cetera. And when you look at the contrast between the Syrians asking Israel for help with earthquake relief and Erdogan coming to Israel and begging for us to send people, and we do immediately after the earthquake hits, and what's happening on the ground in Israel the question is, how do we explain this yawning divide between how the world sees us and how we really are and how the elites in Israel that are now in an open revolt that Supreme Court President Esther Hayut refused to come to a ceremony at the Knesset, or she came to the ceremony, she refused to have her picture taken uh, with the other heads of the, of the arms of government, of the President of Israel, the Speaker of the Knesset, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and even her friend, opposition leader Yair Lapid, she didn't want to have her picture taken with him. She wouldn't deign to do that. She claimed that she had scheduling problems, but she had no problem sitting in the gallery in the Knesset for the Knesset 74th birthday celebration official ceremony. So we see, and, and our own Barack, her predecessor, and she have completely castigated uh, the government's plans for legal reforms. And to understand why, um, we have to understand that their cries are not about the reform. Right? What does the reform do? What what are the what are what are the what is the package that's on the table? What is it that's being discussed in the Knesset's constitution and and uh, legal and law committee uh, today and may go to a vote uh, as early as Wednesday or Thursday in a preliminary reading. All they're talking about is the restoration of checks and balances on the judiciary in, the, in Israel. Over the past 30 years, the judiciary, as we've talked about repeatedly on this, converse, on, on this show, has arrogated it to itself unchecked powers to legislate from the bench, not only to cancel legislation, which was one of the early powers that it arrogated to itself, but actually to dictate what has to be in the laws. No other Supreme Court that I know of does that sort of thing, even the most activist. And they also intervene in real time in government policies and tell the army, no, 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 to tomorrow you can't 
destroy the home of a terrorist because we don't think it's right or he was only using his bedroom and you know you got to leave the rest of the co the house open so that they won't allow the army to carry out counterterrorism operations in real time um and they have taken this power nobody gave it to them they seized this power without legal basis and so in comes the government says look you know we're not going to touch anything about your judicial independence to judge, to judge, but not to legislate and not to dictate policies. That's the purview of Israel's elected representatives. So what we're going to do is we're going to recognize that you have, as you did before you took away all of our power, you have the power to judge, just like every Supreme Court in the world. But we also have powers, among others, to appoint justices, among others, uh, to limit uh, your writ of, just, of, of uh, judicial review. You cannot base your judicial review on things that aren't laws because right now they say that if we think it's reasonable, we the justices think that it, something that the government did or something that or a law that the Knesset passed is unreasonable, we're going to cancel it. So you can't cancel it on the basis of how you feel. You have to cancel these laws if you want to cancel them. We're going to give you the right to, that you stole. We're going to now accept that you have the right that you stole to uh, overturn laws. But you can't do it without basis in law. You have to actually make your judgments about the law. So these are the kinds of things that, that are, these aren't the kinds of things. These are the things that are in the judicial reform plan. And when they're calling for a civil war, they're doing it for two reasons. I mean, we, we know why uh, uh, the former Supreme Court president, Aaron Barak, who seized all these powers as the president, is against it because they're taking away all the powers that he took for himself and for his colleagues. And we know why the attorney general opposes it, because she's going to have limits placed on her power to dictate government policies as the attorney general. And we know why uh, Esther Chayut, the per current Supreme Court judge, this, uh, is doing that. So why are the Zev Razes of the world and the Ehud Baraks of the world, Benny Gantz, Yair Lapid, all of these leading politicians and political activists and elites, really the creme de la creme of Israel's financial sector, its legal sector, its military sector, four former chiefs of staff are in open, open rebellion and one deputy chief of staff. Why? I mean, do they really care about, they, they're so against the balance of powers in Israel? Well, kind of, but it's not just the balance of powers. I mean, they have these kinds of tantrums over everything that the right does because the problem for them isn't so much the content of one thing or another. What uh, Avigdor Lieberman, when he used to be on the right, and they said that the country was going to go to hell in a handbasket because he was appointed defense minister. It's not that they oppose him per se. It's not that they oppose Netanyahu per se. It's not that they oppose the reforms per se. What they oppose is sharing power with the left, with the right. They think that they, through the Supreme Court and the legal fraternity for the past 40 years since they lost the working class in Israel and lost their automatic majority in Knesset elections, they've tried to maintain their power over the state through unelected bureaucracies. First and foremost, the Supreme Court, but the legal fraternity more generally, the IDF chief of uh, uh, general staff, and other very senior nodes of power in Israel that are under the elected leadership of Israel. And so they see this reform as a means to restore the power to lead to the people through their elected representatives. If you restore the power to legislate to the Knesset and the power to govern to the government, then the permanent bureaucracy in Israel is going to have its wings clipped. And that's something that they don't accept. And then there's a last thing also. When we look at the statements that they're making, the likes of Barak, the likes of Zev Raz, or I can't remember his first name, but uh, Chodek, the uh, leading, uh, the, the, the senior attorney, and all of these very, very senior people in Israeli society that you know have an open line to the prime minister, an open line to the chief of staff of the army, an open line to the senior journalists in Israel, et cetera, et cetera. They're their friends, they hang out together. And if they don't hang out directly together, they have common friends. What is it that they really feel motivated by? And I think that the answer is contempt and hatred. Because when we look at what they're saying, 
They don't even see the other side. Yair Lapid, the head of the opposition, gave a speech at the Knesset yesterday at the Knesset's 74th birthday celebration, saying, if, if we don't get our way, we're leaving the country. We're taking our finances out. This is the first time that we feel that the country we love is no longer ours, and we're not going to accept. And he gave this, in a way, very endearing portrait of the of the distress that the people on the left are feeling now in the face of the government reforms. But there was one word that was missing from his entire speech, and it isn't by chance, compromise. He didn't say, we'll sit down and talk to you. Let's try to reach a meeting of the minds. He didn't say, reasonable people can differ, but let's see, okay, I'm gonna come to the Constitution and Law Committee tomorrow, and I'm gonna put out a different proposal, and let's see if we can come to terms. He didn't say, look, I have some ideas, let's see if we can go over your draft, take some stuff from yours, take some stuff from mine, and come to a compromise. We all agree, I've spoken about it in the past, he has, about the need to clip the wings of the judiciary and place limits on its power. He talked about his father ran on it, Tommy Lapid, the former justice minister, the late Tommy Lapid, Yair Lapid's daddy. They ran on these things. These were their signature issues. And now suddenly, right, any reform of the judicial system is the end of democracy, is the end of the country. We're picking up stakes. We're leaving. We're taking our money with us. We're taking our jobs with us, et cetera. And we hate all of you. It's because they won't see the other side. Because actually sitting down and having a talk in the Knesset, recognizing that the people of Israel, the public that voted for this government, and that's voted for successive right-wing governments over the past 40 years, since, uh, since the first time that the Likud came to power in 1977, so almost 40 years, almost 50 years ago, they, they, they don't accept that they have the right to lead. They don't accept that people like uh, Justice Minister Yariv Levine, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the head of the Constitution Legal and Law Committee, Simcha Rotman, and others have a right to an opinion, have a right to power, have a right to power. And that's the reason why we are where we are. That's the reason why there is no discourse. That's the reason why people aren't embarrassed and want to vomit when they see the picture that Ehud Barak put up of, of uh, Buzi Herzog, of Isaac Herzog, our president, uh, uh, as, as Neville Chamberlain, understanding that Netanyahu is Hitler in that picture. They don't think there's anything wrong with that because they don't understand that there's something wrong with the way that they're looking at their fellow Israelis. They truly believe that they are the only people in this country that matter, that their votes are more important than the majority of Israelis, that they should lead this country because they have the right to lead, because they are the people who are enlightened and better than we are. And that's the problem. This is a psychological problem more than a legal problem, more than a substantive problem, a policy dispute. It's not a policy dispute. It's a social dispute. Who gets to lead this country? Do the people actually have the right to determine the course of Israel? Or are we supposed to be instructed by our betters? It's a fight between democracy and aristocracy. And when we talk about reaching a compromise, it's all well and good, but a compromise can only happen when both sides recognize the legitimacy of the other. And today, I think that if Lapid, Gantz, Esther Chayut, any of them would get down off of that tree and say, listen, okay, let's look over your draft. Let me see what is the problem here for us. Maybe, you know, we want a larger majority in the Knesset that can overturn Supreme Court decisions. Maybe we don't need that at all. <clears throat> Maybe we can look at this another way. Let's look at, let's start. You have a bill here? Okay, let's work on it together. Let's see what we can do. If any one of them were to do that, so much of what's happening today in Israel would stop and we would be able to act like grown-ups. but there's nobody acting like a responsible adult. And so we see in Syria, they want our help, right? In Turkey, they want our help. Sudan, Greece, everywhere. Germany wants our help with, with drones. Everybody wants our help. Everybody looks to us and sees what a successful country we are. They see what an extraordinary people we are. They see that we don't want nothing from nobody except to be left at, uh, on our own to do our thing. 
They see that we're not threatening them and we were willing to help them. But here inside of Israel, we have an elite that refuses to recognize that they're part of a larger society and that their success is a function of the entirety of Israel. And that if they want to continue to go forward as a people in the country that they love too, they have to recognize that they're not here by themselves and that the rest of us here are not here just to serve them. Now I'm going to be, we're going to go move from this opening to an interview that I did with my friend David Wormser, who you all know a couple of days ago, where we're talking about these issues and how this fight, this social clash between the elite, between the woke in, in the United States is, case, the, the elite in Europe, and the people, is playing out all over the world. One side is not looking at the other side. One side is not acknowledging the humanity and the rights of the other side. And until that happens, we're going to see success, success on the outside and inside. We're in turmoil. Thanks. So we'll keep going. And we're back again this week with uh, uh, Dr. David Wormser, my colleague from the Center for Security Policy, who's joining us remotely from uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, so first of all, thanks, David, for coming back onto the show. It's always great to have you on. Oh, it's, it's wonderful being here. Well, we, you know, it's been a long time since we've spoken. In fact, I didn't even get a chance to see when the last time it was. But, um, you know, there's, it, I think that since last we've spoken, uh, the left in Israel has gone uh, completely crazy. Uh, I've spoken about this a lot in, in uh, recent weeks on the, on the show, but uh, I wanted to talk about it with you because uh, for a couple of things, I wanted to talk about the left here uh, in and of itself. And I also wanted to talk about it uh, in the sort of larger uh, spectrum of the left throughout the Western world, which increasingly, uh, as I see it, seems to be turning its back on their own nation states and on uh, nation is nationhood of their own nations and also on democracy. Uh, we hear more and more about elite rule and about uh, enlightened people and about what what's what's right and what's normative behavior and that those are the sorts of things that are the purview of a very small select group of woke individuals in the United States and and. Uh, and better thinking uh, individuals here in Israel, they keep changing the names or, or the meanings of, of basic words and concepts like democracy uh, to mean something completely different. So um, first of all, uh, you were here in Israel last week and uh, you were looking at what's happening here from an outsider's perspective. And I just wanted to get your impressions of um, the Israel that you saw uh, as as a visitor while you were here, one who, who knows this country well and is also very well aware of what's happening in the United States? Well, obviously, one of the overwhelming uh, factors uh, in Israel last week when I was there was the debate over the, uh, the reform, the legal reform that the new government, uh, which was elected only two or three months ago, uh, is uh, proposing uh, in, in parliament. And the debate really has acquired a dimension I've never seen before in Israel. I've been going to Israel since, well, probably since most of your listeners have not, uh, before they were born. Uh, certainly since 77, I've been there a lot. And I've never seen uh, a situation like this where it's not only uh, the extreme left is now engaging in revolutionary and violent rhetoric. I mean, there's calls for the assassination of the prime minister, there's calls for civil war, there's calls for using guns against opponents, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, it really crossing the line to outright incitement to kill. Uh, and, I, and that, of course, is, is, is way beyond anything we've, we've seen, except for some teeny, teeny little fringes. Before, these calls were made by top lawyers in the country, uh, a brigadier general in the Air Force, uh, uh, retired, but still was a brigadier retired general. Retired colonel, not and not only that, but he's a he's he's a storied, you know, Zev Raz. He he was he was the lead 
uh, F-16 and the 1981 attack against uh, the Iraqi nuclear installation, Osirak nuclear reactor, um, and uh, and so yes, he's 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 somebody who's well known. He's also been well known more recently as one of the leaders of the anti bb riots uh, that took place outside of the prime minister's official residence during Netanyahu's last term in office after he was indicted. So, um, yeah, he's he's right. both a war hero so, but, and also a hero of the woke revolution here. But I, I suppose some people can take comfort in the fact that this is maybe a small minority. But the truth is, when you look at the overall debate on the left, their basic point is Foreign Prime Minister Barack saying this government, this new Israeli government, has no legitimacy to rule. There's no basis for what he says. It was elected properly. Nobody d disputes the elections. Nobody disputes the coalition formation. This is an outright cut and dry, clear election. Uh, and yet he says they don't rule legitimately. You have uh, a calls for civil unrest to shake the ground beneath the government, uh, calls by major figures, including um, uh, major uh, high tech figures saying, well, that's it. We're going to pull our money out of the country. Uh, trying to encourage foreign uh, fears about the stability of Israel's economy and rule of law. You have the uh, former Bank of Israel heads say that the country is going to face economic, uh, economic damage from all this. Uh, so you're talking about really the institutionalized establishment left, not a fringe element. You could dismiss a few. But this is an overwhelming feeling that this government is driving Israel off a cliff and that therefore uh, they are saving the country and democracy from itself. Uh, of course, that's an inversion of the government was properly elected. So to save democracy from itself, you have to ignore the results of a democratic election. And when you really dig into this, what really struck me was they're not engaging the right side of the spectrum. They're not addressing the points the right side of the spectrum is actually making, neither in terms of concerns or solutions to those concerns. There's no debate. There's just an outright rejection and conflict from the left and no interest in a debate. And I think it was symbolized just yesterday by the fact that uh, the president of Israel, uh, uh, Herzog, uh, President Herzog, called on convoking sort of the top leaders of both sides to start dialogue because the, you know this can tear the country apart. And sure enough, just because he dared propose dialogue, pictures of Neville Chamberlain or pictures of Herzog dressed as Neville Chamberlain, and of course we've already seen the pictures of, of Netanyahu as Hitler and so forth, suddenly appeared everywhere as if now Herzog no, 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 no. Yeah, let me just, just be more precise. The person who put them out was Ehud Barak, the former prime minister of Israel, the former yes. chief of staff of the army, and the former chairman of the Labour Party, of which Bougie Herzog, Yitzhak Herzog, the president, was also the chairman. Uh, he was the one who posted a picture of Bougie Herzog as as Chamberlain, Neville Chamberlain, coming back, waving the Munich ag agreement in his hand. Uh, of uh, of appeasement of Hitler, which means that he that Herzog he was saying was Chamberlain, and and not and 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 Netanyahu is Hitler, right? And he apologized and, afterwards and outright, he to Herzog, but he didn't apologize to Netanyahu. So it's even worse. It's a former prime minister, the former head of the Labour Party, saying that the current sitting president is Neville Chamberlain, and the current sitting uh, prime minister. Is Hitler right? And 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 it's really astonishing. So this the, the rhetoric is 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 crossed every red line imaginable, every single red line imaginable, and it's and it's and it's calling for the removal of a democratically elected government. I mean, if you if you buy every single thing the left in America says about January sixth, multiply it by ten or a thousand or a hundred. And that's what you're getting in Israel right now, which is a group of people, the side of the spectrum that has no claim to having won the election or, or acquired the right to government, is trying to bring down the government and trying to use the legal structures, uh, the, uh, not legally use the structures, use legal structures to essentially 
launch what is a, a judicial coup. So I, I think that's the political climate. The reality, though, what's so shocking about this is when you dig into the weeds and you actually discuss calmly what is the legal situation in Israel, the judicial situation in Israel, which a lot of these people who are screaming have admitted for years is, is, really, is really a mess, and the proposals to fix it, um, what you see is, is that the magnitude of the problem and the moderation of the fix compared to the extreme shrillness of the debate, especially coming from the left, uh, is, is out of whack. And that tells me something more deep is going on, that the, in fact, they have now, uh, the left believes that it had structures that allowed it to continue to rule, even when it lost elections. And uh, the right has finally figured that out after 75 years of the state, disenfranchised populations feel that they may have a shot at finally structurally allowing for their enfranchisement. And this is so uh, uh, cutting to the bone of what is the problem that those who benefit from the problem are truly now in, a pop, in an apocalyptic state of mind. So I think it's genuine what they're feeling because they think they own the system. They feel that system is about to be compromised. Uh, and I think that shows the essence of the problem, which is uh, a left that cannot win democratically anymore, so has institutionalized its power through non-democratic structures, uh, legal structures, but not democratic structures. And the right, which is trying to uh, go back to the foundations of Anglo-Saxon democracy and parliamentary democracy and reestablish the sovereignty or the, 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 the 1689 uh, Bill of Rights in Britain, which established that the parliament is the voice of the people, is the servant of the people, and that therefore the independence of the parliament uh, is representing the, 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 the independence of the people. And if you compromise that, undermine it, or shut down parliament, you are shutting down the voice of the people. So, David, you know, one of the things that really rises, it, you know, comes to my mind when I'm listening to you, aside from the contempt that they clearly have for just the average Israeli voter. And, uh, you know, the, the, they show this in, in any number of ways, saying that you voted wrong, you wanted this judicial reform thing, and therefore we're going to tank the economy, or you voted wrong, and therefore, as Zev Raz said, uh, all of our leaders should be killed. You know, I mean, that, that's literally what he wrote on his Facebook page. He said that they have to start uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, Netanyahu and all of his ministers have to be killed if they uh, if they dare to pass this uh, legal reform package. Um, so that that's extraordinary contempt. But you know, the other the other aspect of the left that's so notable is that, like, you know, you were saying that these are all uh, the first. You know, these are the creme de la creme of Israeli society. These are the elites across a whole spectrum of economics and military, academia, law, all of all of journalism. Of course, the media here is 100 percent uh, behind this and in many ways leading this. So these are the top echelons of Israeli society uh, across the professions, really. And they're also incredibly radicalized. I mean, they 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 want to tank the national economy. They're going to Standard and Poor's and saying lower Israel's credit rating. Um, you know there was this one uh, reporter in Yedia Rachonot, uh, Itamar Eichner, who wrote really in in a in a depressed way. Well, it's it's really depressing. Netanyahu spoke to these business leaders in uh, in Paris on Friday during his uh, official visit to France. And none of them asked him about the legal reform, and he was really bummed out by it. And they they have lost the connection to the mothership. They don't care what happens to this country, and they even say so. They say, you know, if it's not our way, then we want to tank the country down with us. They have no fellow feeling for the people in the government. Like you said, they're not going to have any substantive conversations with anybody. They refuse to. Uh, they even said so. They said, if we discuss anything with them, then that means that we think that they're legitimate and they're illegitimate, and therefore we're not going to have any conversations with them. So, I mean, 
you know, a couple of questions arise from this. One is, where does this lead? Do you think Israel? And and then, you know, after we talk about that, you know, how do we put this in line with the United States? We had Tony Blinken here last week, uh, who was giving us, you know, uh, ultimatums on the Palestinians, which we can talk about afterwards. But do you see um, connections between the Biden administration and what's going on here, the American left and uh, what's going on here? I know that the American Jewish community, the the leadership of the American Jewish community is attaching itself to this rebellious uh, elite and uh, castigating the Israeli government. But where do you think, first of all, it's going to be leading to on the ground, these calls for murder um, and violence and, and refusal to give any legitimacy whatsoever to the will of the people in this country? Well, unfortunately, I think that there's going to be an element that will not accept it and uh, no matter what happens. And uh, they have to be watched and monitored very carefully. Uh, you could see for the first time in Israel's history a European-style sort of radicalized extreme left emerge uh, with some with some terrorism and so forth. Uh, except, you know, they don't have to engage in terrorism because there already is terrorism coming from the Palestinian side. So all they have to do is just support them and they don't and, and, and so forth. But uh, so I think you're going to have a, a fringe element. But I think in the middle, what will start happening, middle left, is they're going to realize that they're, the Israel they, they're trying to preserve, which is the Israel that was created by the labor, hyper-secular, socialist, Ashkenazi elite in the country they owned, doesn't exist anymore in the shape and form and numbers that they believe should be. That, that's the Israel they want to somehow preserve. But that's not the reality of Israel. The re, Israel has... A, a much larger sector of traditional uh, Jews who at least respect religion if they're not religious themselves, religious Jews, Sephardi Jews, immigrants who are not part of the Mayflower crowd, Ethiopians. Israel is not what it was in the 50s, and what it was in the 50s was not right. Um, it, it, it imported uh, or, or brought in a whole series of immigrants and then basically told them, uh, we're going to shape you into images of ourselves. And if not, you know, th th you're not part of the system. You don't own Zionism. You're not, you don't have, st you're not a stakeholder in this enterprise. So I think, I think what you're seeing is, is on a larger section, an anguish over the realization that they're losing the power to control the system in the last areas that they can continue to run the country. And those areas were very powerful. They were the courts, the education system, the uh, military's top leadership, not the rank and file, by the way, the, uh, the military's top leadership, uh, some of the high tech companies, because through their uh, sort of advantages and so forth, they, they had dominated some of the education system. But even there, it's breaking down. Uh, business elites are beginning to break down. So. What you f see is a whole crowd feeling the country is slipping away from their control. And I think a lot of them are anguished by it, but eventually will reconcile and figure a way to navigate through it, uh, as well as generational change. Young Israelis are, are, are more to the right. I mean, it's one of the unique things about Israel is when you look at the military vote, uh, which is defined, uh, it's not a poll. We know what the military voted and military uh, is defined in terms of its age in Israel, tends to vote to the right now. So you see the country is shifting, and I think that's just going to happen. And uh, the majority of the left, after a lot of anguish, will eventually come to terms with it and begin to try to work its way through that. But I wouldn't rule out a very violent, extreme, far left. And by, by extreme, I don't mean necessarily one or two people. If you look at some of the words coming out of major figures from the Merits Party, for example, Yair Golan and so forth, these are justifications for some seriously uh, dangerous, uh, it's, it's sort of the political cover for some dangerous tendency. So we're talking about maybe not one person or 10 people, but potentially a measurable 
material percentage of the far left, which can become a real problem. And of course, they have the the Arab population also that they can tap to batter the state. And you already see that happening. So I, I'm optimistic that the center uh, in Israel will eventually reconcile. And some of the center is probably recoiling from from this. And, and, and then lastly, once this really goes on for a while, what the actual reform is will start filtering into the public debate. And people will start thinking about it. And it's really not that unreasonable. So I think a good percentage of the middle will begin to come to terms with the fact. Yeah, exactly. Well, not well, they, they, they will they will begin to come to terms with the fact that despite what they're hearing from the press, despite what they're hearing from their opposition leadership, despite what they're hearing from hearing from the Supreme Court and its and its alkalites, it's themselves that actually these are quite reasonable things that empower people and, sh- and shore up democracy. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that, that, that the reform will win out in the end, number one. And number two, it even has, the, you know, right now the Likud has 64 seats. If they wanted to, they could talk to nobody, change nothing, uh, and simply ram it, ram it through with 64 seats. They have the power to do that. Um, so, they're, they're really, the cards are not out there for the for the for the real opponents of reform. Also, the polls show sixty to seventy percent of Israelis know their legal system is messed up and out of control. So the bottom line assumption is there. And then one fi- <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> one final observation that really struck me when I was in Israel last week about this reform is you had four or five waves of seriously anguishing uh, circumstances in Israel's history to the right. Oslo, which passed by the skin of the teeth in the parliament through some parliamentary tricks and gave up the heartland of the Jewish people to a terrorist organization. The, The breaking down of settlements that had been established by people who, and, and people living there who were the salt of the earth, part of our military, uh, the removal of Gush Katif, the settlements, towns in Gaza, the violence and the complete lack of recourse, a complete lack of recourse anybody on the right had to the legal structures uh, was, was an anguish, uh, losing their homes. We're not talking about some theoretical thing about democracy. People lost their homes and they had no recourse and they were arrested and uh, they were treated quite, quite harshly. And yet, at the end of the day, the right, they never sang that famous song, En the Eretz Acheret, namely, I Have No Other Country, but they acted it. They acted like this is their land, they have nowhere else to go, so they have to dig in, screw up their nerves, and find a way to get the majority of Israel behind them. In over 15, 20 years, they've done so. So now Israel is a different place than it was 20 years ago. The left, now that things are going not their way, their reaction is, well, we're going to take our money and go. Well, we're not going to pay taxes. Well, why don't we get the others to burn the house down? Why don't we get you know, J.P. Morgan or whatever to lower the credit ratings? Uh, so the commitment to the country And the feeling that you have no other choice but to make it work, the balance from an outside observer is toward the people who want reform and and, and those who and and those who feel that finally they can be enfranchised once those reforms go through. So I think the balance of will ultimately politically uh, drifts in that direction, despite the numbers in Parliament right now and the numbers of the the polls. one one of the things that I find notable is that you know they keep t- telling us that uh, they being the the left the unhinged left uh, in all its der- you know various uh, permutations whether in the media or or the people on you know the the people in the mob and in all of these demonstrations calling for violence and murder or or what have you or the high tech people who were assaulting motorists who were when they were blocking traffic in Tel Aviv uh, uh, last week and, and all, all of their others, is that 
you know, they keep saying that Israel is going to become Hungary or Poland, and they never talk about what actually happened either in Hungary or in Poland. And I, I mean, what happened in both of those countries is that the conservative traditionalist uh, factions in, in those societies uh, seized power uh, democratically. What is seized power? They won power in elections and they took the, the country in a direction that they wanted to go in, which was very different from the direction that the elites in Brussels want them to go. But they didn't do anything anti-democratic. They did everything in 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 line with what the Polish people on the one hand and the Hungarian people on the other hand wanted. And what you really see here is a rejection of this globalized post-nationalist uh, world that the that the post-nationalist uh, transnational elites in places like Brussels and Davos and uh, New York are are advocating. And and what's and and what's so amazing is that the people who hate the Hungarians and hate the Poles and hate uh, Israel, um, they and hate the Italians. They're Italian, they're, the they're sort government. of in, they're colluding now with the Israeli left, or the Israeli left is seeking their assistance. I mean, we see this very very clearly with Haaretz newspaper, which is. Um, partially owned by by a german publishing house that was actually a nazi publishing house which is always a little bit of you know uh, uh, a poetic irony there but um so here they are uh they're pushing so hard for international intervention against israel and i wrote a piece about it in newsweek last week also where i recalled that in 2007 haaretz says editor david landau Asked the United States, asked U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice at the time at a dinner party in Tel Aviv uh, for her to um, for her to rape Israel to force uh, the government, which was then a left wing government run by Ehud Olmert, uh, to uh, to give the uh, the PLO more territory in Judea and Samaria. So this is this is a modus operandi of the left here. But it's also a modus operandi of the left everywhere, which is to demonize and castigate every leader, whether it's Donald Trump or Benjamin Netanyahu or Viktor Orban or whatever the Polish guy's name is, and 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 say anybody who wants to have their borders uh, uh, protected, anybody who wants to preserve their national history and way of life. Uh, is a fascist and is evil and is anti-democratic, even though all of these people won uh, in in democratic elections. And uh, so there, there's so much similarity between what we're seeing here in Israel and what's playing out all over the Western world. Yeah, what's playing out in the whole Western world is a global temper tantrum. And and it, and it's it's clear. Uh, that it's the same sort of elite structures. The European, the European Union's elites are not democratic. <clears throat> they now want to have a European Court of Justice, which operates again like the Israeli courts on some vague principles that they can appoint. They don't base their decisions anymore on law. They base their decisions in the European Court of Justice on some some lofty principles that can be interpreted and imposed in any way to legislate. Uh, undermining the sovereignty of the of the various legislatures of the countries, let alone the countries, which is why you have British leaving, why you have the Italians voting against this, why you have the Swedes, uh, and why you have you know a lot of the Eastern Europeans pretty done with this because they realize they you know a lot of these Eastern Europeans they didn't fight for their freedom from the Soviet Union only su to submit to some other large transnational political structure of ideology, so. You see, but but I think there's a deeper issue, which is the left over the last 50 years, first of all, has become far more radicalized, but also far more institutionalized. It, they have managed to take over in Europe and in the United States and in Israel. Well, in Israel, it was baked into the way the nation was created by the Labour Party and, the, and, 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 and so forth. But But they have managed to take over main structures, whether it's the vast majority of print press, whether it's TV and, 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 and TV press, or whether it's cultural institutions, the school systems, higher education, 
uh, and so forth. In the United States, they failed, though, in a number of areas, the Supreme Court uh, and so forth. And, and in the press, well, there was just a new structure of, of information created through Fox News, Newsmax, and so forth, and then social media. They created social media. They more or less controlled it. And you see what, what happens. Elon Musk, who's a hero of the left, buys Twitter, removes the pro-left censorship that Twitter had internally. And all of a sudden, Elon Musk, fr frankly, they would rather put in a word for the devil than Elon Musk at this point. He's utterly demonized within a year, within a half year. So I think what you're seeing is the left has institutionalized its power over an immense amount of Western society. All the cards are basically in their hands and they're being rejected. They're being rejected by the people, whether it's the phenomenon of Trump, whether it's the phenomenon of Maloney and Orban and, and uh, Boris Johnson, whether it's the phenomenon of Netanyahu, they're being rejected by the people. People are not happy with this world vision. Yeah, but I mean, when you talk about so, when you talk about the, let me just say, when you talk about the institutionalization of the left's power, you're right. But it, it's also through the infiltration of intelligence agencies. I mean, what the Twitter files exposed oh, was yeah. that the FBI had taken over Twitter. And, I mean, you had 80 FBI Absolutely. agents working just in this, you know, in the San Francisco office before the 2020 elections going through the Twitter feeds of individual people and saying this is Russian disinformation, and they knew that there was no such thing. So, it, it, I mean, you have, you, you have something going on here that the, the institutionalization of the left is not only in, uh, in media and in, and in the legal fraternity and, and guilds. I mean, it's also no. in the intelligence agencies, the and we're fraternity. seeing this in Israel. I think it's pretty profound that you have all of these senior you have, I think, four or five former chiefs of staff of the IDF who are in on this, who are saying that the elected government of Israel is illegitimate. It's incredible. Yeah, you so saw here it. you have it, you there you it have it. it. I, look, I, I, one can ascribe a lot to Trump's character and so forth, but I already saw it when I was in the White House under President Cheney uh, in, the, in the Bush administration. Vice President, President Bush. Cheney. Vice President Cheney under President Bush in the in the in the Bush administration, the intelligence community began to become a sabotaging arm. We didn't talk yet about some of the details of the reform and the use of the legal branches of the of the Israeli government, the uh, the legal advisors or what would be in the United States Attorney General's office or so forth, um, to essentially sabotage and paralyze policy. Well, you started seeing it in the United States with intelligence and foreign policy. Essentially, the intelligence communities would generate policy-based analyses. They didn't have objective analyses. They had policy-oriented uh, analyses. And then they would turn around and they would say, this is the reality. And your policy, President Bush, doesn't, accord, doesn't square with what we're seeing in intelligence, which was, of course, uh, stilted. Uh, and that therefore you're 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 lying and people are dying and, and and things like that. So essentially, the intelligence community in the United States already in 2000 to 2005 made the point that the government is only an advisory body. Intelligence will tell you what proper policy will be. So you see how whether it's the legal system in Israel, the intelligence structure in the United States. You see this institutionalized power beginning to assert itself through a, a narrow group of elites, assert itself over any democratic structure in the U.S. government. At the end of the day, the president represents the American people. His policy represents the will of the American people for four years. It isn't the intelligence community's choice to pick and choose what they like and actually do policy and pat pat the political echelon on the head and said, well, that was entertaining, but uh, please now go away and let us really run policy. But that's the, that's the sentiment that you, you feel heavily. And, the, and, and, and you can only imagine when you get to the legal structures how utterly devastating that is because that can shut down the entire government. And, and then essentially in Israel, if you're a right-leaning government, it essentially has been shut down. 
So, you know, I mean, for, now, for four yeah. years under Trump, we saw such incredible parallels in the way that the legal establishment in Israel was hounding and hunting down Benjamin Netanyahu. I mean, they they now we're learning more and more throughout his criminal trial, right, of, of how they persecuted everybody who came close to him, all of his advisors, and they were strip searched and humiliated. They had their reputations destroyed for nothing. They were uh, essentially tortured uh, while they were under arrest on no charges. They were denied sleep. They were denied food. They were put into these flea infested cells. Uh, and uh, they had their their attorney client privileges were completely uh, disregarded, uh, and they were using family members against one another, arresting people's wives, arresting people's children to try to put pressure on them to to cop a plea or to or to give, give you know to, or to to give a uh, Netanyahu and just say anything against him to try to incriminate him. I mean, these things are are shocking, and they're shocking the conscience of Israelis, and that really is the thing that pushed so many Israelis over the edge, realizing that this just cannot go on, and we need legal reform, and it turned legal reform into the most important uh, voting issue in the November 1st elections in the United States. By the same token, you had a completely concocted tale of Russian intervention not in one U.S. presidential election in 2016, but also in 2020, right, when they pretended that Hunter Biden's laptop was concocted by by Russian intelligence agencies, which was a total lie. It was it was his all along. It was all true. And you had 50 intelligence uh, professionals, so-called, signing a letter saying that it was it was a Russian disinformation campaign. But you, you had Trump and everybody around him even his very distant advisors like uh, like uh, like uh, um Tr- Carter Page you know is like a volunteer in his campaign they're hounded hounded their lives are turned upside down they have to spend millions of dollars which they probably don't even have on legal bills to defend themselves against an FBI that just wants to get Trump and i mean the the parallels between the two situations were were stunning to anybody who was paying attention to what was happening in Israel and in, and in the United States, and it and things have only gotten worse. So in Israel, we have taken a step forward to cleaning out the deep state, and the deep state is is on a rampage. And in the United States, you know, they just shut it all down. They went into Mar-a-Lago, took whatever stuff uh, Trump had there, said that he had stolen nuclear secrets and God knows what else, and and you just don't know what, you know. Yeah, All of the people who are in positions of authority seem to be important. lying. You know? Absolutely. Look, in the end, it, it, it what happened in mar a lago by the way, amounted to pretty much nothing. I mean, there were a few documents that weren't very important, certainly not nuclear codes or anything. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what you're seeing here is ultimately um, the arrogance. You see, they've created such a bubble around their their power that they're no longer listening i mean you see it in this public debate in israel and by the way this whole thing shows why israel matters in the united states to the administration it matters because if israel goes wrong it begins to break the grip of this fraternity this aristocratic class that runs israel it has it it, it has reverberations in the united states because it's a, it is a similar situation. And in fact, it is really part of a larger situation. So what happens in Israel matters for Macron and the EU elites. What happens in Israel matters for the left here. But it also matters for the other side, for our side, for, for the Republicans, uh, for the Maloney's and, the, and, and Boris Johnson's and so forth. Because at the end of the day, um, breaking that beginning to expose what's really going on here uh, and and what's and, and the political uh, failure essentially of let what's happened is they've enclosed themselves in a bubble through social media through the press they're, they've been talking to themselves now so much for 10 20 years that they've acquired this sort of lofty arrogance to their views against common people 
and you started seeing it with the election of Trump in 2016, you started seeing the shift of blue collar workers in the United States of all ethnicities toward the Republicans because they felt that they were roadkill to the left's ideology, this, this great ideology that the elites had had. Um, you started seeing it in Europe, this growing tendency among European countries to entertain more and more to the right uh, because essentially the EU elite is no longer legitimate in a democratic way inside the countries. And then finally in Israel, you see it in, uh, in the rise of this left who cannot win elections. Uh, you know, let's face it, they ran the last government, but it was really only for two, it was a year and a half, number one, and number two, only because they could convince a right-wing party to form a left-wing government. So it was no verdict toward the left. So what you're seeing is a fundamental popular rejection of this aristocracy, this, uh, you know, philosophically, one could call it the embodiment of the philosopher king ideology, a group of highly intellectual, great philosophers are the best to run the country, not the people or anything else. So it is really the philosopher king ideology of Plato, uh, which has led to communism and, and the French Revolution and so forth. Anyway, bottom line is you see the democratic rejection of this idea in the institutionalized power. And that's a clash that is now happening. And they've used Orwellian speak to essentially turn upside down the meaning of every word. So when you have a democratic reaction to an aristocratic retrenchment of power, they call that anti-democratic. When you talk about t telling the courts that they have to actually make judgments based on law, not make law to make judgments, that is called rule of law rather than law, uh, to, you know, the arbitrary rule. of the lawyers. So you see, exactly. So, so what you see is also the inversion of language here. But of course, the United States is left is going to be on the side of the Israeli left, because it's the same threat to their aristocratic control. Um, and I think that's really the subtext of what's going on in Israel. And the fact that the left feels it's losing ground, it feels the threat, and it's being rejected on a popular level, that then drives the tantrum in hysteria that we're beginning to see everywhere, not just in Israel, but in the United States. So Israel is basically the harbinger, the act, first act in what you will see here in the United States eventually, too. Well, I mean, in a way, the thing that most, most dis distresses me is that here in Israel and there in the United States and in European countries as well, you see societies that are just breaking apart or breaking up. You know, you, you have, you, you know, you, you worry all the time, where is the center? And the center seems to be shrinking. But I'll just give you an example. I mean, this week or late last week, uh, Congress under Kevin McCarthy uh, threw Ilhan Omar out of the House Foreign Relations committee and just to give you a sense you 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 people were viewing i mean you know who she is but it's i don't know how many, how well reported it was that the iranian foreign ministry uh, uh condemned the move because she was a shill for the iranian regime against the iranian freedom fighters on the streets demanding you know calling for a revolution and and the overthrow of the regime so she was on the side of the Ayatollahs, just like she was on the side of Al Qaeda, who she laughed off as nothing, and Hezbollah, who she laughed off as nothing, and she's an anti Semite. Then the thing that was astounding to me were two things. One is that every single Democrat voted against throwing her off the committee, including 22 Jewish Democrats in Congress. All of them thought that it was a great idea to keep this woman, who is a stooge of Iran who is an out-and-out -out Jew hater and pro-Al-Qaeda and anti-American on the House Foreign Relations Committee. That is a testament, I think, to the, you know, if you need to know an answer, who is in charge of the Democratic Party? Well, we know Ilhan Omar is in charge of the Democratic Party because whoever is in charge is the person you're not allowed to criticize. And nobody can criticize this out-and-out -out Jew hater, just like they don't criticize Farrakhan anymore. 
and um, and and everything is fine, and all of the anti-Semites are on the right, and uh, and anybody who says differently is an anti-Semite himself, because there can't possibly be any anti-Semitism on the left, because to be a Jew means to be a leftist, and therefore, if you're anti-leftist, you are by definition anti-Jewish, and that's that's the kind of thinking they have, and it's the same thing here. They're not being anti-Israel when they're boycotting Israel, when they're calling for an economic boycott of their country, when they're calling for Standard & Poor's to lower Israel's credit rating for nothing except that they don't like the way that the public voted. I mean, you you see here, you know, and, and they call B.B. Hitler, which is a form of Holocaust denial. It, you, you just, um, you, you, you're seeing a society falling apart. You're seeing one side rejecting their nation's right to self-defense, whether it's Israel or the United States. And you're seeing the other side saying, no, we do have a right to self-defense and we're going to maintain it and we're going to fight our enemies. So, I, I mean, this is an alarming phenomenon. I mean, it's not it's not new. We saw it already after 9-11 when the left in the United States said, what did we do to make them think that they had to attack us? What did we do to them instead of just accepting that America has enemies because that's just how it is? Or in Israel, when after after September of 2000, uh, the left wanted to blame Ehud Barak for what happened when the Palestinians rejected peace and statehood and, and went to war and declared jihad against Israel. So you know, you have you have this radicalization of the left. It starts on the fringes, and then it moves to the center, and then there is no center anymore. And all you have are two very divided societies: one that holds all the nodes of power, and one that wins power in elections. And that's an intentional strategy. It's it's forcing it's it's a forced um, division. Uh, you know, it's. Um, you almost have to look now at the global left in religious or theological terms. They're not religious because they don't believe in God and so forth, these elites. But they have replaced it. It's an ersatz religion. They've replaced it with a certain body of ideas. And like a religion, they're beginning to, uh, especially an ideological, a religious ideology, they're beginning to acquire all the characteristics. The first one is a certain degree of anarchism and nihilism. Then you have after that a certain, you know, the old pendulum theory that if you destabilize things enough, that the, the pendulum swings back and forth and you grab. So, so there's a deliberate sort of forced division uh, and forced choice uh, that is behind these ideologies. You can't just be offensive that you have to be mobilized to their ideology. So somebody who says, listen, just leave me out of it, that's not acceptable. You have to actively take part. You see it physically when you had the summer of 2020 riots. If you remember all those um, various restaurants and so forth in Washington, people would come around and they'd force the guests in the restaurant not to say, oh, it's okay, you know, I'm not, I'm not right wing or anything like that. They forced them to spout the slogan of Black Lives Matter. Why? Because they cannot accept a middle ground, a third way, uh, uh, a middle. They have to mobilize that middle toward them. So they're forcing, like every religious ideology does, forces a division. Then you have the second thing, which is these religious ideologies. They have a vanguard elite, and that's the philosopher king. It's people who have a better knowledge who are seen to be somewhat superior in their awareness of the ideology and understanding of the ideology that then becomes sort of an above, an, an uber class uh, that, that rules over the more uninformed masses that don't have properly yet have the conscience. So that's where the elites come in. And it's a whole structure. And if you look in the West now, that is essentially what's emerging. And that that is not a structure that can be ultimately moderated it has to be defeated and that's why the battle for the middle is very important but the battle also to discredit the ideas and the ideology behind this civil secular religion that has emerged are also very important i'm not saying secularism has to be defeated but this secular religion this 
this the, that you see it in the halls of Davos and so forth. This has to be defeated uh, as an idea, like other ideologies have to be defeated. And only then well, I, are you going to see that, the, think... the pressure to divide the country to stop. No, I, I agree. I think I think we're seeing that a bit, and I think that the left here in Israel um, is making a lot of mistakes. I think uh, it was a mistake to go after the president of Israel for trying to find common ground. I think that it's a mistake for them to call for murder. I think that you know a lot of these things are are mistakes, and and I think that they are losing. Uh, they are losing the sort of the the few centrists that are still around in Israel who are getting a little bit frightened by them. And I'll say one other thing, which is that you you have all the people who are the heads of the venture capital firms in Israel, and they are very far to the left. It's people like Errol Margalit, who started off uh, in Meretz and then moved to the Labor Party, which is the same thing, very, very far to the left. Uh, so the owners of the venture capital firms are left, but all of the engineers are on the right. So right now, all of the engine, not all of them, but, you know, about over half of them are. And they're quiet because they need the VC people in order to invest in their companies. But at the end of the day, if it's not going to be Israeli VCs who are investing in their company, it'll be somebody else. It'll be the government or it'll be or it'll be uh, outside forces because their ideas are good enough, then they're going to attract uh, capital and it just, and they're going to have to stand up for themselves. They're afraid to, because they don't want to lose their funding. But, you know, I, I think people are getting tired of being bullied as well. You know, they see the footage, they see the calls, they see all the PLO flags and these anti-government uh, rallies in, in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. And I mean, in Tel Aviv and in, in Ranana and in other places, and they're freaked out. I mean, the day after the massacre of the of the seven uh, Jews outside of their synagogue in Jerusalem, you had demonstrators in Tel Aviv holding up PLO flags, and that that really was stunning to a lot of people. So I think, Absolutely. you know, I, I hopefully over time things will cool down as they make more and more mistakes. They become more and more uh, uh, nuclear, you know, radioactive. The head of the, until last week, the head of the uh, demonstrations was the head of the Bar Association, and he literally got caught with his pants down, you know, in this very embarrassing uh, video that, that was exposed of him uh, trading sexual favors for a judgeship for a woman who may have been his, his uh, paramour and may have just been somebody who was, uh, he was abusing, but... Uh, Whatever the case may be, he was disgraced. The Bar Association was disgraced. The idea that they should be involved in the selection of judges was just, you know, was just destroyed. So, I, I mean, things are happening. And hopefully, you know, and, and you see in the United States, Hunter Biden acknowledged that this was his laptop. And a lot of people are waking up to the fact that the Russia collusion thing was a complete lie. So we'll have to keep watching this space. I think we're going to have to cut a, cut off the discussion for today but i think that uh you know we've covered a lot of ground we we have some real conceptual problems with with our left in the international community uh generally in the west and in israel uh, specifically and there's a lot to learn about it and a lot to overcome so Absolutely. yeah i thank you for joining me in this journey and we will see you guys Absolutely. again next week and talk about it from another perspective so in the meantime, we'll see you later and uh, have a great day.